Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Little RPG Podcast, episode number 77. Uh, I am Ruel Mejia, I'm here to bring you the latest Little RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. Uh, and this week we have uh, quite a few new Little RPG reviews just for you folks. 11 new ones, including uh, The Witch Doctor, a Little RPG short story uh, that by the same exact author, uh, Grim City. Uh, then on to Earth Online, episode 5. On to, after that, it'll be The Liar King. And then after that, it'll be The Pantheon Moves, after which it'll be Redeemer of the Dead, then The Builder's Wrath, and after that, it'll be Camelot Dungeon Arthurian Let RPG, uh, that'll be Awaken Online, this is actually a side story in that series, uh, called Retribution, and after that, it'll be Nascent, uh, The Stroke Tower Book 1, and then last but not least, but The Beginner's Luck by Aaron J. So those are the stories we have for you upcoming. Um, but of course, we'll be getting our show though with Little RPG News. And in Little RPG News, we'll begin with the story of, uh, well, I actually have a couple author interviews that have come up recently. Uh, letting you know about them recently, I had a chance to talk to Aaron Jay, the author of Beginner's Luck. Um, he, This is his first novel that he's ever written, um, and it's going to be a Little RPG because he's a fan. And apparently he's been reading for quite some time. I've seen him in like, the chat rooms and Facebook groups uh, over the last couple months. Uh, so it was good to get a chance to talk to somebody who's an enthusiast for the genre, but also has taken that step to be a writer in the genre. Um, really good story. Well, the full review for, of course, later in the show. Uh, but the author interview is available now. You can go check it out on our Facebook page or on our um, actual website, Geek Bites Podcast, in the author interview section. Uh, so there you go. Uh, also, had a chance to talk to you this week, Michael Chatfield. Um, he, I met him personally at Dragon Con. Really nice guy. And this interview was no different. Um, he's the author of the Amarillia series. He's written... Uh, 10 books this year has a number 11 coming out in December. He's actually moved that from November to December. Um, he has a different novel coming out in November for a sci-fi series he's um, catching up on. Uh, but of course, you'll catch all that in the author's interview. Um, we have a live link floating around somewhere on our Facebook page that if you want to watch that version, it's not quite as polished. Um, I, in the full, like polished version, which will come out Tuesday on November the seventh, I tried to do um, some new visual formatting, including like a, a live chat box, because we did do it live actually. Um, and and a few people from the Little Pitch community showed up. They wrote some comments, some jabs, and some nice questions and some comments as well. And those are all actually in the polished version, which will come out on on Tuesday the seventh. Um, so it's interesting to see what you guys think of that. Additionally. Um, if you note the difference in sound quality between uh, Aaron Jay's interview and this one, I got some new equipment and hopefully you guys can tell the difference on the sound. Uh, hopefully it's much better and improved. I think it is, uh, but that's a biased opinion, obviously. Okay, um, more Little RPG news. Uh, Pharaoh Book One. Their book is coming up pretty soon in November, the sixth book in that series, I believe. And so to celebrate that and to get people interested, um, they're slashing prices, slash, 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 uh, on Pharaoh Book One. Uh, it's going to be 99 cents on Amazon until November the 6th. So you have a few days to catch that. Um, it's actually a legitimately good book. Book one is probably my favorite at this point, um, off the top of my head. Um, so go check that out. We have a link in the show notes for you to click on if you want to go check that out. Also in, you know, little RPG deals, we have, um, Apollo's Thorn. He has another book coming out on November the 6th called Level Up or Die, um, and to, promote that book he is going to be giving his other book codename freedom uh out for free it'll for one day only on uh, november saturday november the 4th it is going to be available for free um so market candlers folks and go grab that book it's a really good book um i encourage you to do so it's quite nice okay um oh in a little bit of news as well we have dave wilmarth um had reviewed his um, debuted Little Pretty Novel last week. Uh, gave it a good score, 7 out of 10. Um, but he's been pleasantly surprised, apparently, by by the readers who actually bought the book. Um, he mentioned like myself, I don't think expected too much. I hoped well, um, but the audience and community was like, oh yeah, they, they seem to enjoy the book overall. Um, and he had a statement for the community. I'll read it off to you. 
Uh, I want to thank you all for the amazing response to my first book and you take the opportunity to share my good fortune with some folks who deserve it much more than I do. Uh, starting now, the next $500 from royalties earned will be donated to the Wounded Warrior Project. It should only take about two to 500 ebooks or, you know, full Kindle reads to meet that goal. So he's actually um, intending, um, apparently he, he covered the cost of producing the book and now he's looking to spend the next $500 that he gets in royalties from Amazon like uh, whenever he gets some uh, on the Wounded Warrior Project. So that's a good, I think that's a good, you know, turn. Like somebody who's doing well, uh, had some success with something that they, they put as a, as a passion project and they're giving the proceeds at least the next $500 worth to a good cause. So um, go support. It's also a good book. Okay, out now. Uh, there's some, some lit RPG stories uh, that are showing up on the list and on Amazon listing, I should say. Um, haven't read them yet, but they are available currently. Uh, the Beatdown by Malugan Ojintadi. Sorry, I'm probably saying that wrong. I believe this is the same author who wrote a um, a choose your own adventure style uh, lit RPG story, or it tried to be. It didn't do very well. Um, I'm hoping this one actually is a straight story. I read a little bit of it, and it seems like it is. Um, so I'm looking forward to catching it, because I really did like the author's writing style and his take on um, different cultural perspectives in, in combat in, and in RPG stuff. Um, it just didn't work as a as a choose your own adventure. So I'm hoping that this is going to be um, what I was looking for in the first place, but I'll definitely be checking it out. Also out now is the Nightmare Game Slayers by S.R. Witt. Um, and the black hat, this is by Domino Finn, um, out now too. This is book two and after life online book in the after online series. Um, book one was actually quite entertaining. Had a good time with it. A lot of people have enjoyed it as well. Um, also and now was space nights book two by Samuel E. Green and Michael Scott Earl. It's a collaboration between the two authors. Um, enjoyed book one. Hopefully book two is as good. Uh, also out is Hugo Huesca's Dungeon Lord, the Rast Haunt, a literary series book one. Also out is E.M. Hardy's On My Brother's Grave um, Reconnaissance. Um, it's the Vatinkeist online book one. That's what the author has. Okay, uh, out also in new audiobooks. A lot of fans in the community of Liberty also enjoy the audiobook versions of stuff. Um, Travis Bagwell's novel, which will be reading the ebook version in this podcast. He he did it. He got the uh, audiobook out at the exact same time. So it is also available now for you if you prefer the audiobook version of things. It is read by Davis Stiffel. So go check that out if you like audiobooks over ebooks. Again, we're building in the show notes and of course the review if you want to go check that out. Uh, of the ebook version, I should say. Uh, also out is Morningwood, Everybody Loves Large Chess, Volume 1. We reviewed that um, the ebook version of this novel last week as well. Uh, gave it a good review. Um, the audiobook uh, narrated by Jeff Hayes, friend of the podcast and really good narrator. Uh, that that audiobook is also out as well. Uh, we also have, again, a link to our review for the ebook if you want to check that out. Uh, also out as an audiobook is The Adventurer's Heart, Book 2, Adventures on Brad, written by Tao Wong. And Lion's Quest Trinity. That one finally came out as an as an audiobook. So it is out currently now by Michael Scott Earl. A uh, very nice story as an ebook. Uh, and this one, it was actually definitely a surprise. This is an, a slightly older um, lit RPG novel. Actually, I think it's a completed series, if I'm not mistaken, for The Bathroom Night, um, written by Charles Dean. Sorry. Uh, it is also going to be, you know, I, I don't think he put the name of the narrator on the cover. Um, but... Um, I've listened to like the sampling of it. Sounds really nice. Go check it out for yourself, though, of course. Because, like, as always the case with audiobooks, um, the not only does the content have to be good, but the narrator has to kind of fit your vibe. I guess is the way of saying it. Um, some narrators work well for some people, some don't. So go listen to sample on Audible and decide for yourself. But as far as like, the content, the ebook version, we have a review, of course, linked to it. Um, Seven out of ten for me. Uh, again, it is a slightly older. Um, novel though um, so that's probably why you haven't noticed it lately. but it is a good, quite a good uh, novel as far as an ebook goes okay uh, in upcoming Little PG this is just where I list off the stuff that's coming up in the next couple months we have on November the 6th Underworld Level Up or Die on November the 8th it is Desert Born Pateria Online Book 2 on November the 15th it is Dungeon Calamity The Divine Dungeon Book 3 on November the 15th as well Bloody Crucible Lone Wolf by E.C. Chi. 
Okay, also on uh, November the 16th, it'll be Shatterlands uh, Book 3. Uh, on the 17th of November, it'll be The Airship, a futuristic dungeon core. This is uh, by Skylar Rand. This is the second book in the Laboratory series. So there you go. Uh, on the 19th of September, this is the big one po folks have been looking forward to for, for months and months. Um, book seven in the Chaos Seed series from Alan Kong of the Land. So um, we'll try to, this gives you enough time to like reread books one through six to catch up. So it'll be out on November the 19th, though. Uh, on the 22nd of November, it'll be Eden's Gate, The Sands. On the 30th of November, Infinite Assassins, Daggerlands Online, Book 2. And then on December the 4th, The Twilight Obelisk, Mirror World, Book 4. Uh, on December the 5th, Amarillia, Book 11. On December the 13th, it'll be Desert Storm, Pateria Online, Book 3. On January the 24th of next year, uh, it is The Reapers, which is Neuro Book 3. So there you go. Those are all the stuff that's coming up uh, that I'm aware of. In case, if, if you're an author who plans to put a uh, Little Bitty novel up um, anytime soon, get, you can always let me know. You can send us uh, that information at uh, feedback at geek, geekmindspodcast.com or at uh, littlebittypodcast at gmail.com. So there you go. Uh, on to uh, new releases and reviews. Uh, okay, on to our first uh, Little RPG review. Uh, now, the, actually, the first two Little RPG reviews in this particular episode, they're actually with the same author. Uh, and I, I, I think this is a very interesting contrast because um, one is not Little RPG um, and one is. And the distinction is sort of subtle, um, but it is there. And I'll explain during the reviews why I make the distinction between making one Little RPG and one is not. Uh, and I'll give my reasons why, of course. Uh, we are going to begin with uh, The Witch Doctor, a short story by Ed Branch. Okay. Um, this is 75 pages, 99 cents. It's a short story. It is also available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, this is the author's description. A nerdy gamer is asked to test drive a state-of-the-art virtual reality game designed to boost tourism to an ancient Native American historic site. The name of the game? Legend of the Witch Doctor. What should have been a fun opportunity for Ben and his college classmates turned into a nightmare when the students find themselves immersed in horrific sensory overload and unable to leave the game. Ben must now pull out all his gaming experience and creat creativity to work in order to defeat the game and free his trapped classmates, including the woman he loves. Uh, Witch Doctor is a little bit short story. That's a loss of it anyways. Okay. Um, the novel starts off with a historical scene of a Native American tribe uh, working with white settlers to banish an evil witch doctor. Um, it then specs the next 20% of the novel, uh, setting up two characters, Maggie and Ben, two college students that visit a haunted Indian burial site um, with their history class. Okay, part of the exhibit is a VR game that is supposed to show the site and incorporate the myths of an ancient evil spirit that's supposed to reside there. Um, everyone, of course, gets trapped there and starts getting murdered by zombies and the evil witch doctor. Uh, basically, this is a horror story set in VR. It is not, however, lit RPG. Um, and I, I'm not sure if the author quite understands the particulars of what it is, uh, but again, we'll get into the second. Uh, there are several mentions of game stuff. Um, at the 20% mark, there's a small character sheet. It doesn't end up being, you know, actually mattering. You never see it again. Um, at the 40% mark, there's a notification that there's an objector for everybody to survive being murdered by the witch doctor. Um, at the 52% mark, you start getting notifications that people are dying, but it's just like, oh, this person has died. This person has died. Um, and at the 58% mark, there is um, a health potion that's used. And that's the last you see of that. And that's kind of it for the story. As far as the game mechanics, there aren't any really. Uh, this is really just a horror story set in a VR stimulation. Um, a bunch of college kids running around and the undead murdering them one at a time. Um, there are no skills or stats that seem to matter to the story. Like you're given a, a, a stat screen or character sheet for one of the characters, but you never see it again. It doesn't seem to affect anything in the game. Nothing improves. Uh, so there is no progression in the novel. But anyway, should form as far as a game mechanic. So or any kind of um, experience points and nothing, nothing like that. Uh, there are no levels, uh, no skill gains. So it's just people doing stuff inside of virtual reality, game, which is not a, a bad setting for a, a horror story. I'm not saying that it's, and it's a bad setting. It's just that it's not RPG. It's not, there's no RPG element here. It's just 
essentially a horror story set in a VR game or in a VR simulation, which, which is what he really is. Um, not a little RPG though, so it gets a score of four out of ten. As far as the horror story goes, um, not really my cup of tea. Um, it, it it was kind of boring to me, and but I'm also not a big fan of horror novels or movies in general. So um, as a horror version of it, if you're into that kind of stuff, go give it a shot. It's on Kindle Unlimited, nine nine cents. So it's not like a huge investment of either time or money. Um, but it was it my thing. Get the score of four out of ten, mostly because just it says little RPG. Not little BG. There you go. Simple as that. Now, the uh, second book is also by the same author. And again, this is a comparison between two different stories. This one actually is Lit RPG. I'm going to get into um, why there is a difference between the two in a second. Okay, it is uh, 94 pages, 99 cents, available on Kindle Unlimited, so slightly larger. Um, this is the author's description. Miranda Mandy Tesser desperately searches for a missing girl in a zombie-infested post-apocalyptic wasteland. Many battles, uh, sorry, Mandy battles, nightmare men, scavengers, and her own personal demons as she tries to preserve a semblance of humanity in a world turned upside down. Okay. Um, fundamentally, this is kind of a blandish attempt at combining zombie horror and little RPG, but it is little RPG. Unlike the other story, which I just talked about, it actually has RPG progression, which is kind of the key difference between that story and this one. Um, this one has the first 14% of the story actually being straightforward lit RPG stuff, like the main character shooting zombies and killing things or critical shot notifications. Uh, there's a there's a, a, a nice section about uh, the main character's character sheet and her class information, what makes it different from other classes potentially, and what her role is in this uh, virtual reality game. And it actually is a game. There are actually game mechanics here. Um, there is a middle section in between where it's just the main character describing some um, world building stuff and character development stuff, which is not particularly entertaining, but it is there. Um, and then the action starts up again. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it for people who want to actually read it, but um, once the action does show up again, you do get also a, a, a second look at that character sheet and the main character's cane points in awareness and dexterity. She basically showing that her actions matter and that there was some progression. And it's always hard to fit these kinds of things in a story, especially if you're writing a short story. So I get that there's not going to be a ton of game mechanics or RPG mechanics, but at least this novel, as opposed to the other one, showed actual RPG progress, even if it's, there's not a ton of it. And throughout the game, actually, throughout the rest of the story, um, there are also more, you know, damage notifications whenever the main character gets a critical shot, there's an notification for it. Um, but the rest of the novel does lessen what those mechanics are. Like the author chooses to focus and set on the horror action, you know, chase scene action stuff. So you do get, uh, after the 70%, 70 mark, you get less game mechanics. But again, that's also just a story choice. Um, the, and while this isn't a great example of Little RPG, it wasn't particularly entertaining for me. Um, it's basically for me just a giant, a long monster chasing. Um, it is still Little RPG because the author established um, game mechanics at the beginning, um, showed you what the main character's character stats are, and then showed you later on that there was actual progression based upon the character actions. Um, and that is enough, especially if it's a short story. I know there's not as much time to do like game development stuff. Um, and for me, that is a difference that differentiates between little RPG and not little RPG. Uh, the fact that there are game mechanics that matter in the story uh, and there is character progression according to those game mechanics that are established and the fact that it doesn't exist and that the game mechanics, even though are the, there may be things that say game stuff, uh, they don't matter to the story whatsoever in that, for, in, that in the, in the witch doctor one, they don't affect the story in any way, shape or form. And they, don't come up again. If you took them out of that story, the story would basically be almost exactly the same. So again, that's the difference for me, at least. And I think this is a good just comparison example between, okay, this one makes it, this one doesn't, and why. So there you go. Okay, um, on to number three. This is going to be Earth Online, episode number five, um, The Memoirs of Lauren's Wrath, the fifth playlist. Um, and the author forgot to write his name on there again. Oh, no, it's there. Gabriel Rathwig. It's you just hard to see. Okay, uh, this is 148 pages, two dollars ninety nine cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, the author doesn't actually give a particularly good description or um, of, of what the series is or summary. Most of it is 
don't read this if you're not a if you're not interested in if you're anti marijuana, if you're a troll, if you're a hater, if you don't like fun stories or not like video games or t- are a terrible human being. Don't read this book. It's it, there's a, a huge amount of scammers. Um, and he also says, on the other hand, if you like those things, are irreverent, uh, like irreverent humor, pop culture, bad jokes, gratuitous language violence, uh, or you're a fan of Your Highness Chichen Chong's Christian Brothers, The Adventures of Baron Munchaisen, The Princess Bride, The Goonies, Half Baked on Weed, uh, then the story's for you. And this is definitely is this entire series is stoner little RPG. It, it's the only stoner RPG I've ever read. Um, it's it's highly entertaining for me. Um, I, you know, the the first novel in this series. Um, isn't quite letter BG, but everything else after that totally 100 percent um and it's it's just very funny um and the author also always um includes a playlist of songs that are kind of uh some great background music when you're reading this that are also themed towards each chapter uh and he includes that playlist on the uh, dis- um, novel description but also in the book so i encourage you to, to listen to those songs they've always expanded my um my musical uh interest because it's always something new maybe it's not always something that i would have picked up for myself uh so even just on the musical level um very interesting way to incorporate that into a a, a novel so i always give a, a recommendation and plus just on that originality alone okay now as far as the uh the novel itself again super funny stoner little bd um this is probably my favorite novel in this series so far uh it, on the game side it expands the story including like some town building st- mechanics and some magical theory stuff which is kind of neat um on the story side there's tons of action adventure airship fun um it's again a short story at 148 pages um and it's hard to talk about a lot of the pop without spoiling things so i won't go into too much uh, but if, if you've been following along with the series, there's totally an advancement in the dreamlike revelations about how the main character's uncle lied. Um, from the 30% point on, though, it's just straight super funny, highly inappropriate stoner action comedy. Uh, there are so many stoner jokes and so many just irreverent, um, highly inappropriate comedy jokes in here and action stuff that it, it's just thinking about it makes me really smile. Uh, it's a highly entertaining. Um, uh, I don't know. I'll say one thing. I learned in this novel what the word changa means. I hadn't heard it before. Um, and part of me wishes I hadn't actually learned about it. Uh, but part, another part of me seriously cracks up every time I think about that scene in this novel and what that actually means, apparently, according to the author, at least. Um, and I, you know, I can't help it. Um, also be aware that this novel has a ton of cursing and some sex references towards the end. Uh, and it's, it's very not PC. In a lot of instances, or at least it's, it takes these situations and makes jokes and cracks about them. Um, so you're either going to love it or you're going to not like it. Uh, so there are a lot of things about it that you may not like. Sex, drug use, uh, marijuana use, um, and, you know, cursing and some other situational stuff. Uh, so I think the author actually does a good job of describing, like, if you like those other things you talked about before, like Cheating Chong's Adventures, uh, The Princess Bride, Goonies, Half-Baked, on weed, you know, you're... You basically know if you like Sterner comedies or not, or Sterner stories, and this is definitely one of them. So if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll like this. We're not, you're not going to like it. Uh, it's as simple as that. But, but for me, I'm a huge fan of like Kevin Smith. Uh, he, he, his movies, his podcast inspired me to do my own stuff here. Uh, so I'm always a huge fan. I give the score a seven out of ten. Highly enjoyable for me, at least. I know it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea though. So just FYI. Okay, on to our next one. Um, the Liar King, Tower of Babel Book 2, written by Adam Elliott. This is the sequel to the um, Speed Runner. If you've read that novel and you enjoyed it, um, you may like this one. You may not. I'm not I'll let you know the differences. Um, it is 400 pages. Ooh, nice and meaty. It is $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. From the very first hour, Caden set foot inside the massive real-life game that was the Tower of Babel. Nothing had gone according to plan. A unique skill, a handful of new friends, and the wrath of an ultra-wealthy patricidal lunatic were just some of the complications to his best-laid plans. So why was he even surprised when a special event trapped him, his companions, and dozens of other players inside of the tower, uh, scoring them off against a murderous army of stone-faced warriors? Uh, There are... If, rather, they are to have any hope of survival, they have to leverage not only their personal power, but the power of the Elon as well. Those are the NPCs in the story. Uh, There are castles to build, armies to be raised, and one real question to be posed. 
how good is a self-proclaimed RPG nerd going to be at turn-based strategy? So there you go. Um, this is this novel definitely takes a shift shifts away from the original storyline of Speedrunner. So if you really love that storyline, this doesn't really do much to advance it. It is the same characters. Um, the game mechanics are different, and I'll get to them in a second. But it is it almost feels like a different novel set in the same universe, just with the same characters uh, in a lot of ways. Um, the main character Caden is dropped into a, uh, a special event that turns into the city building resource management turn-based strategy game. And I know those are a lot of words, uh, but there are still tons of like regular good action scenes and dungeon knives in this new game. Um, sorry, rather, but the new game mechanics are really the highlight of strike. They're the main thing. Um, and, and if you're, if you enjoy strategy games, if you like things like resource management, if you like games like Civilization, Age of Wonders, those kind of games, you're really going to love this novel. Like this is going to be like, this is going to get you in. This is going to make you, I don't know, build extra resources in your pants. Um, but if you don't like those kind of games, if those aren't your cup of tea, you're probably not going to like this as much. Like you're still probably, there are going to be things you can still enjoy about it. Like there's still regular action scenes and there's tons of like good storyline like that, but you're not going to like it as much as somebody who's just like really into like sim uh, like civilization games or strategy games um, or turn-based action games. Uh, that that's, that is the thing in this novel. So you're, you're either really going to like it or you're like going to enjoy it still, but not quite as much. Um, there are all those game mechanics from those stories in here, including hex maps, unit production, building productions with bonuses, turns that have to be planned out in advance. Um, there are resources to manage like research, food, production, magic, influence. Uh, there's still, again, lots of action, but it's just modified to include things like stats, like mobility, morale, attacks, and defense values. And it really is told on a larger scale. Like the main character, um, this is a little spoiler, but he looks at a, a special screen and he can actually move real life um, NPC characters, um, in battle when they're fighting other like armies, like, so like have these pieces and pew, pew, people are like, clash, 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 cause it's swords, not, not guns. Um, and again, if you're not a big fan of strategy games, you might not like it as much. You'll probably still find it enjoyable, but not to the degree, like if you're into that kind of game stuff. Um, for me, I like strategy games, but I usually play the campaign once and kind of forget about it. Um, I don't re repeatedly play those games on different difficulty levels or different scenarios or do online play or anything like that. I like strategy games and I like turn-based strategy games, um, but I'm not a super uber fan. Um, so the new mechanics were, were neat and I like them. Um, and very few little bridge stories take that kind of game mechanic and do something with it. I can only think of one other author, uh, Scotty Fuchs, who's ever done a turn-based strategy little bitty story. And now there's another, another player in here. So I th think the author really did do these mechanics very well. Um, but it, it is, it is, uh, it, it's going to appeal to people who like those kind of games a lot. Um, me, I was personally happy to see that the author, uh, had one of the, a new character play the juggernaut class, which is, uh, what the class that I would have liked to have played if I lived in this world, just cause it sounds cool. And I, I want a red helmet, you know, with like, you know, small slits and have magical, like correcting powers or whatever. Um, and I thought that it was kind of fun that the author kind of did a little nod, uh, to that particular class and expanded upon it. Um, there are going to be a few points in the story that are going to possibly bother some people. The story ends without fully resolving the situation. Um, that's, that's started in this novel. Uh, it's not so much as a cliffhanger as it is a you can tell this is like, oh, part one in a larger story arc. So uh, this probably should be called Liar King part one um, instead of like just the Liar King uh, because it is really, you can tell that the rest of the story is going to be continued and resolved hopefully in the next book or next two books or whatever. Um, also, the last 8% of the novel is a sample of another little bit of story that the author is planning to release. And I think it might be just testing the water to see if people like it or not. I thought it was cool. Uh, so it's enjoyable even in if it has like a little bit of um extra onto the end of the novel for me the entire thing gets a score of seven out of ten i had a good time reading it so there you go okay on to the pantheon moves this is emirelia book 10 um from michael and chatfield that guy i did that author interview with recently or one that you'll see <laughs> eventually Okay, uh, this is 355 pages four dollars 99 cents. It is also available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, i'll read you the author's description Wins and losses. There is no time to celebrate or mourn. The pantheon in the chaos has once again risen to power. Some trying to take power from one another, others supporting the people of Emerilia. As the people of Emerilia finally getting ahead of the war against the events of myth and legends, of those that were spawned in those 
that entered through portals. Oh my gosh. I'm just realizing the descending commas. Um, the Pantheon once again displays their might. Uh, win or lose, there are no other paths open to the people of Emerilia. Okay, so there you go. Uh, very interesting author description that I just realized. Um, basically, this is like book ten, uh, 10 in the series. If you haven't decided you, you like it or not um, by this point, I'm not sure to tell you. Uh, I, by book 10, you probably already decided you enjoy it. Um, if you didn't like it, you probably skipped a long time ago. Um, but for me, um, this was highly entertaining, very good action stuff. Uh, the story starts out on a very kind of sad note. Um, be, and that's mostly because of what happened in book nine. Like there were hints that people were going to die and not come back. And in book 10, that is actually a reality. Um, there's big revelations from the various pages about who didn't make it out of book nine. Um, and some folks that permanently again, some people come back eventually. Um, and those deaths are kind of used as a rallying cry, um, not against the monsters that are being released in Amarillia, but against the Ducal Empire. And that's what this is for the most part. This the big underlying theme of this particular story is preparation for the upcoming rebellion against the Ducal Empire. Something that, that is kind of talked about and prepped for in the other novels, but this really gets ramped up in this particular story. Like everything kind of revolves around that final preparation stuff. Um, yes, there's a lot of other things that happen in the novel. The advance of myths and legend storyline wraps up. Um, the fight between the members of the Pantheon begins. Um, but a good portion of the middle of the story is just prep for the next big fight against the Ducal Empire. Um, there's lots of switching perspectives between different characters as they wrap up storylines and prepare for a larger space battle that we'll see in book 11. Um, the middle section of the story can feel a little slow occasionally um, if you're not into like crafting or training scenes. But for me, I, I still enjoyed it. But again, it does slow things up. Like the author tries to drop in some action stuff. But overall, a, a lot of the good action stuff comes at the last 25% of the novel when things are just grrr, like lots of fighting, fighting, uh, and like really good fights too, by the way. Uh, like in the last 25% of the novel is almost nonstop action. And there are some legitimate surprise twists in the story, which I was happy to see. I hypothesized about some of these things happening, like from book one when I reviewed it. Um, and it was, it was interesting to me, at least, to see that some of them came true. Maybe not in the way I thought they were, but I, you know, good, that just means there's good foreshadowing that the author did. So good job on, on him. Overall, a good read. Um, it, even if the series is sort of leaning t more and more towards space opera um it was still a good story i had a really good time reading it and i look forward to reading book 11 so good job seven out of ten okay on to our next review redeemer of the dead a little bit apocalypse uh the system apocalypse book two by tao wong and again this is the sequel to um life in the north if you've read that this is pretty much more of the same um, it is 298 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. Four months ago, the world changed as the electronics failed, and blue screens started appearing, gifting humanity with abilities, classes, and skills straight from a game. Caught in Klondike National Park during the apocalypse, John manages to fight his way free and reach Whitehorse. Unfortunately, the system hasn't finished with humanity yet and the dungeons begin to appear, bringing with them more powerful, stronger, and smarter monsters. Can John and his friends survive and level up? So there you go. Okay. Um, again, this is a good sequel to Life in the North. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and it's a good read, but you need to know what you're getting into if you're going to enjoy this. Um, this is, really is a slice of life, daily adventure story set in a gamified post-apocalyptic Earth. There are great fights in here some really good ones um especially that last fight in this in the, in the series it's quite quite intense um but there's not much plot and don't expect that in the story um it's action adventure dungeon diving character development and some world building um you, if you think of it as like a serialized liberty adventure that's been collected together in a story like in in a, in a novel form good that if you can expect that and the novel will reach your expectations. If you're expecting more, if you're expecting like this huge plot of some kind, like you're going to be disappointed. Just accept it for what it is. And you, you will pr probably have a good time. Um, for me, I knew what it is going into it. I like that kind of story. I'm okay with daily adventures, slice of life stories. Um, I think they're really cool. They just like to plug into and tune out and do other things. Uh, that, that's how I, how I view them. Like they're, they're really easy to like put down, go do some other stuff, maybe read something else and come back to it. And you don't feel like you've, you've lost anything at all because like they're really segmented adventures. 
Um, so for me, it was good. I give it a score of 7 out of 10. There you go. Okay, on to The Builder's Wrath, the legendary builder book four, written by J.A. Cipriano. Okay, uh, this one was kind of a disappointment. Not that the story is bad or anything, just that it felt repetitive from like the other books. Um, but I'll get into that. Uh, it is 460 pages, $4.99. That is available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. After Dread laid waste to heaven, defeated Lucifer, and kidnapped Gabriella, Arthur will do anything to stop him, even if it means teaming up with Hell's greatest enemy. Armed with a sword more powerful than ever, Arthur has one chance to rebuild heaven, uh, forge an alliance between the angels and demons, and find the Holy Grail. If he succeeds, he may just have the power he needs to defeat Dread and rescue Gabriella. But if he fails, well, at least the convenience store is still hiring. It's a joke about like the first book. Okay. Um, basically, this feels like the author has found a formula for me and that he's sticking to it real hard. Um, just like in book two and book three, it kind of follows the same formula, like the main character training, adding to his harem collection of women uh, to gain new powers, um, beating an enemy or almost, and then being challenged by an even greater threat at the very, very end to keep you hooked in the story. Um, and again, this is not like it's bad writing. It's just highly predictable, at least for me. The action is still very action-y. Um, there's enough stuff in there to actually be a little RPG, like the main character gets back his powers to um, um, increase people's levels and distribute their, their experience points to increase their skills and whatever they're doing. Um, although it does get overpowered and it kind of breaks some earlier game rules that are established in the novel. But that's kind of a thing with this particular story. Like the author doesn't mind breaking his own rules as long as it makes it it's entertaining for everybody. Um, and for some people, that's going to be an issue because... Some people like things to be coherent and um, for the rules not to be broken that they've already established by the author. Um, and and if that's an issue for you, for that kind of person, um, then you're not going to like this. some of the things in the story. You're like other things. Like the action's re always really good. Um, but that might be something that draws you back. For me, the novel was just like highly predictable. Like every time I saw a scene and it started, I'm like, I kind of foresaw what was happening. And even like the twists were like not very twisty. Um, but overall, like if you if you have enjoyed book two, if you enjoyed book three, you're going to enjoy this one as well. Like if, you, if you're into the action stuff and and the harem thing, um, it's all still here. It's just that at this point, I'm like, eh, I'm like, I kind of see what the formula and I'm like, I can't, you know, I'm, I keep hoping that things are going to change or become original. Like there's going to be like a cool twist that makes this like feel special again. And it just hasn't happened for me, at least for book three, at least. Or what is this? Yeah, book book four, sorry. Um, so for me, uh, get to score six out of ten. Not, not bad or not even meh, but just not quite good for me. So six out of ten. There you go. Okay, on to book, I'm sorry, number eight of our reviews, uh, Camelot Dungeon, an Arthurian lit RPG written by Galen Wolf. He also writes the um, another lit RPG series, which escapes my brain at the moment, um, the Greenwood something. Okay, uh, this one, though, is 263 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. I'll read you the author's description. Uh, returning, though, sorry, the return of Sir Ngaro, Knight of the... King Arthur's round table. Uh, with the fall of the city of Camelot, Sir Gero shines out as a beacon of resistance and hope to the free folk in the north. Uh, but a beacon casts too much light, and soon the servants of the evil one come to hunt him down. Gero is faced with a, a dilemma. Does he abandon his village to raid to the raids of evil minions, or does he attempt to defend it? Or could he come up with a way to disappear completely? So there you go. Um, this is another novel that kind of pivots um just like um the liar king pivoted away from kind of the storyline of speedrunner um this one also pivots from the earlier version of this novel, the book one in the series uh book one was very much um arthurian rpg in that the main character is in an mmo he, he tries out a new class there's a lot of exploration of those mechanics of rpg mechanics and his, and his class stuff you know good action adventure stuff this one um, has the same character, um, but it does delve into new and different game mechanics that weren't established in, in book one at all. Um, it's just from dungeon diving to dungeon creation. That's right. This is actually a dungeon master novel, um, even though you wouldn't know by looking at the cover. Um, in in the context of the story, evil is one. Uh, that was a big twist. Big, I'm sorry. Spoilers from book one. Evil wins. Um, Camelot is is raised to the ground. Um, uh, Arthur and his knights are on the run. They're like going to the south. Um, evil is basically taking over the north. The bad guys. 
except for the main character's um, town and village that was established in book one. Um, but the main character knows that it's only a matter of time before the bad guys come and destroy what he's built. Uh, so instead of just fighting to the death, he actually comes up with a really intelligent idea of going underground. And I mean, not, not, not uh, metaphorically, but literally he has a mine. He plans to transfer the village's assets uh, underground and create like an underground village that's secreted away from the bad guys. But at the same point, he needs something as a cover and a, and a way to keep fighting evil and also get revenue for his for villages, which are expensive. Uh, and so he decides to create a dungeon, like a, a good dungeon. Instead of like, filling it with like evil monsters, he plans to fill it with good monsters and good characters that are going to fight the evil bad guys. Um, and that's kind of what this is. This is a dungeon master story themed with Arthurian legends and like good monsters and good creatures to fight the bad guys. Um, and that's basically what, that's, that's all it really is. Uh, and so going to it, understanding that that's the case. If you're expecting something exactly like book one, this isn't it. This is this is almost a different story, and it might, and it's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, I it almost feels like the author is using this universe to just explore different types of lit RPG storytelling, and in this case, a dungeon master story. But it was fun for me. Uh, if you like those kind of stories, this is a nice, interesting twist. Instead of it being like a dungeon core, it's a dude in an MMORPG who has access to like buying monsters and setting and and buying people who set traps, and he still gets the experience points from the dungeon. So it's really it's it's quite interesting if you're into dungeon core stories or dungeon master stories, as I call them. Um, for me, entertaining is all I gets us a seven out of ten. So there you go. Okay, on to our next story. It is Awaken Online Retribution Side Quest, written by Travis Backwell. Also another gentleman we've uh, interviewed for the podcast before. Nice guy. Um, this one is 276 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, I'll read you the author's description. A side quest adventure in the same world as the best-selling Awaken Online series. This story takes place after the end of Awaken Online Precipice. Riley's real life took a nosedive after her confrontation with Alex. The girls at school torment her and she feels powerless to do anything about it. At the same time, Jason has mysteriously disappeared, sending only a terse, cryptic message to Riley and Frank. With some time on her hands and with the... With her frustration with her real life reaching a breaking point, Riley decides to strike off on her own in-game. Her goal is to investigate the quest related to a strange bow, a bow she discovered in the dungeon north of Persavi. Yet events quickly spiral out of control as she discovers that the bow's former owner has set her along a path of vengeance with the entire city hanging in the balance. Okay, so that's the author's description of the, of the story. Um, basically, this novel is about that character, Riley, from Awake Online. Um, she's the sort of love interest of the main character, Jason, in that series. Um, and this novel takes place in the same universe. So it's it's, it's not a direct sequel. It does take place after book two. And you do get a few hints about what might be happening in that world. But it does focus on her. So if you don't like her as a character... You may not like the story. Um, honestly, in in those books, she comes off a little wimpy and weak. Um, and this novel does a, a, actually a lot to address that character um, pecking, I guess, or character development. She actually has a lot of great character development. She becomes a much more interesting character in the novel. And uh, you get a look into what makes her tick and why she kind of makes the choices she does in life. Um, she, of course starts off with some huge flaws and by the end of the novel some of those flaws are addressed um it, it in that particular aspect it really does m sort of mirror jason's character arc from book one of awake online um this just does it better and you can tell the author has really um learned how to tell a story very efficiently very well and 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 very entertainingly of course um there are two portions of the story the in-game and outgame stuff the outgame stuff really just focus on her being picked on and tortured by the other girls in her school because she broke up with alex the bad guy from books one and two of awaken line um and that whole situation of her figuring out how if she can or should send up to them um the in-game storyline storyline i rather is basically a combination of like world building. Like you can tell the authors building up like um, and developing outside of like the undead city more. Like you get more information about how the magic system in the game works uh, and how there are different cities with different cultures and things like that. So I like that especially. Um, but you also get the storyline of the main character essentially um, going on a mystery adventure. 
um, that I thought was really cool. Um, the it's like the who done it mystery of like the main character following a bunch of leads, trying to figure out who's who's created this magical play case, um, and it's really entertaining. At one point, like generally mystery, I'm not huge into mysteries, um, but this was entertaining. At some point, I. I I generally thought somebody's gonna say, "Oh, it's Colonel Mustard, the fire mage, in the library with the candlestick." Um, it's really that fun sometimes. Um, but there's still plenty of action and adventure. Um, but the mystery kind of component to it helps this side novel stand out from the main Awakening Online series, at least for me, entertainment wise. I had a good time with it. Um, enjoyed. I finished this from. I, Finish the entire novel in one sitting, so that tells you how captivating it is. Um, I give it a score of seven out of ten. So seven out of ten, good stuff. Okay, on to our next story. Um, Nixon, the Stroke Tower, book one, written by Tony Corden. So there you go. Uh, this is 364 pages, although I think that page count is off on Amazon. Um, when I was reading it on my phone and e-reader, it said it was like 600 and 16 pages. Um, so either Amazon is doing this weird page count thing, which it does sometimes. Um, I, I'd say it's probably more like four or 500 pages. So just as an FYI, um, it is $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Limited though. Um, so that is honestly a downside to it because um, when you have a huge page like that, why not? Um, I, the author might have it somewhere else up online or something, but it is not available on Kindle Limited. Okay, um, I'll read you the author's description. Athelia Caro grew up in the negative tax family in a gang-controlled suburbs of Brisbane at the end of the 21st century. From the age of six, she decided that she wanted more, and with the help of her local gang leader, she learned the skills to escape the relentless pressure to mediocrity. On her 16th birthday, she has inadvertently implanted with a neural enhancement chip instead of the free government provided, provided one basic level personality AI. This mistake not only removed the limits placed on the AI, but also broke some of the government in instigated control parameters. Leia's life rapidly becomes a battle, both in the virtual multiverse and in real life. Uh, so there you go. Um, on the short tower by Wang Zing, this is actually part of the um, historical background of the series and why this, it's named this way. It's a, it's a poem by an author. Um, I'll read it to you. It says, Along the mountains sink the last rays of the sun. Towards the sea, the yellow river does forward go. If you would fain command a thousand miles in view to a higher story, you expect it to go. So that's all part of the author's description of this novel. Um, now, the majority of this novel does take place in game. And unfortunately, that's not a good thing this time around. Um, I honestly just found the real world storyline to be just so much more interesting than the game world this time. Um, for the real section of it, um, it's amazing. It's really good. Um, there's a ton of great world building. Um, there's there's great attention to detail about the real world. Like there's backstory for the character, uh, for the main character Leah, her culture, her economic perspective. She's half um, Chinese, half uh, Australian, and that affects her the way she kind of views the world. She's coming from two different cultures. Um, she also grows up poor. She grows up in like um, the housing projects of Australia. Uh, and, and, and that economic perspective is, is very interesting that the author creates this huge dynamic, uh, rich world in the real world. Um, like including like the fact that automation has taken away a lot of jobs in the world and AI has taken a lot of jobs. And so this poor economic block has kind of, um, almost everybody is on this like government, um, assistance program where they get money from it and they have certain benefits like free um, primary and secondary education, also free college if they qualify. Um, but there's also a sub economy because they can't actually get real jobs. Um, they start doing barter systems within this community and it's like it's a ton of great details and rules building stuff here for the real world. Um, and like I said, there's, there's author clearly um, describes great, um, developments in AI and VR technology development as well for the larger world and does a great job of like just conveying subtly the hundred little ways that the rich people and poor people are separated in this future um, world. Um, and there's a, a really interesting storyline about Leia using her advanced AI to try to raise herself up of poverty and get accepted to prestigious universities despite several f uh, attempts to stop her from like rich people and from like the people in power who want to keep poor people poor and rich people rich. Um, and that, that real world surrounding just like, 
really great. I really did enjoy it. But then you get to the game world. Uh, and honestly, it's just so boring by comparison. I, and I wish it was better. It, there's just not as much depth to it. Um, the game mechanics of the story are they're, they're good. They're, they're a little confusing and they don't always make sense. But they are there. They're consistent. They're in the entire story. Um, but I whenever I got to the game world, it just felt so flat and, and there's just no depth or history. Like you tell if the author really took the time and effort to create backstory for the world and he just didn't for the game world. Um, and even though most of the story takes place in there and it's not, it's not like it's horrible or anything. It's just that by comparison, there's, there's just, it's like awesome world sci-fi cool stuff and game world's like, meh. Okay. Um, the main character in the game also, gets things too easy, at least for me. Um, and the, again, this is by comparison because in the werewolf storyline, she works her butt off um, every, and it's described, from a very young age to kind of overcome the natural, um, sorry, the the inherent um, disadvantages of being poor. Um, and she works her butt off in school and she, you know, she, she escapes the game even though she also learns how to defend herself. Um, and you can tell that she worked her, her butt off to get the things she does uh, in, in the real world. And then she gets to the game world and it's so much easier. Um, and she first logs in, she gets a bunch of bonuses and small upgrades. Why? Because she's polite. And that seems to be her superpower, at least at the beginning of the novel. She's polite to the AI and they give her a bunch of like cool quests and uh, small uh, upgrades and abilities, at least like some really overpowered gear. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's not as interesting because she doesn't seem to be working for anything as much. Uh, she even like kills some like high, excuse me, high level characters, like characters that are 10, 20 levels higher than her without much effort in game. Um, and, and on her very first day, she, she magically has the ability to begin high, uh, several high groups of monsters that are above her level and complete an undiscovered dungeon single handedly without much effort. So I'm like, it, it just wasn't as interesting to me. Um, the author does try to do some new things with the in-game stuff, of course, uh, including like puzzles that the reader can solve and some PVP and some crafting. And so uh, the in-game stuff isn't without its merits. It's just that it wasn't enough to really keep my attention and, and to keep me, especially when I, when it would drop back into the real world and it was still just so much better. Um, so like the real storyline was quite nice. I, it would get a seven out of 10 for me. The game one, um, five out of 10, very meh. Um, and I'll split the difference for the entire novel and give it a six out of 10. It is little BG. I was just, the get the role stuff was just so much better. So there it is. Um, six out of 10 from me. Okay. Uh, last review. Um, it is beginner's luck by Aaron J. Uh, this is the author. I did the author interview, which, um, for, and the fact that I did it just cause I, this is a good novel. Um, there's no questions about that. Like anybody who reads it just about, I should say, um, they, they give it good reviews. And even though I'm always like tougher, I guess, um, and they point out things in the novel that aren't quite perfect or like it, like it is quite nice. I'm like it's really, really good. Um, I'll get into the full review though. It is, uh, 308 pages, $3 99 cents. That is available on Kindle limited full disclosure. The author sent me an advanced copy of the novel. Um, I purchased it as soon as it came out. Of course it was that good. Um, I'll read you the author's description. Uh, miles Boone, is finally an adult and able to roll up his permanent character. He will join the game that, that the world has become. Most of the planet is now dominated by feral AIs and Nana who behave as all the monsters of man's imagination. Every adult left alive plays, striving to keep the AI and Nano from wiping us out completely. Success in the game is survival itself. Success in the game is success in life. If only the game wasn't rigged against anyone who isn't a member of the party. A desperate bid to get the same chance at success in the game as, as party members lands him at the mercy of his family's enemies. Now his freedom and life rest on winning a bet. Lose and he will grind the rest of his life in the beginner area for the Eastman clan. He will need all the luck he can get. Too bad his enemies have broken his character and gotten rid of his luck stat. How do you play a game without any luck? Well, there you go. Miles is going to have to outplay and outsmart his family's enemies, the corrupt game masters, the party, and of course, the game itself. Life is a game. His father always told him, win or lose, it's how you play that matters. Now he is praying that his father knew what he was talking about. So there you go. Um, like I said, this is a good novel. It actually comes close to, I, I, I'll, I'll spoil the score. It, it gets a 7 out of 10, but it was almost an 8. It really was pretty close. Like if I was giving sub 
scores, it would be like a 7.8. I think there's just a few things that stopped it from being that eight. And I'll get into what those are. Um, but first let's talk about the novel itself. Um, the game system in this, in this novel is, is apparently based upon a modified version of the 3.5 D and D rule set, which is considered by many, uh, to be like the best D and D game system. Um, what the author does different in this story that other lit RPG novels is one. He sets up a really interesting world um, that has a legitimate reason why people w- would immerse themselves in a VR game for long stretches of time. Um, there's a fully fleshed out world here with its own politics, its own culture, um, and it is as interesting as the in-game stuff, which is always very key if you're going to have an, 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 um, a real-life storyline. Um, two, the author tries to bring a sense of realism to the RPG mechanics. Um, due to the terms of that, Miles, the main character, doesn't get access to the AI assistance that most people use. So he doesn't get hotkeys or AI assistance, co- uh, AI assisted combat moves. Um, so anything Miles wants to do, he has to learn how to do it the hard way, the real way. He wants to learn how to do how herbalism works. He's going to have to pick up a textbook and he has to learn biology um, and and botany. And he start memorizing those things. Wants to learn how to use a sword. He's going to have to find somebody to teach him because he, he doesn't get any like magic powers at his system. Um, the author extends this realism even into the magic system of the world. Um, so if you're familiar with like D&D 3.5 rule sets, you know that there are several components to it, um, like somatic, um, um, verbal components, movement stuff. Um, what the author does, he actually does a really cool thing. He actually pulls into the story um, a basis for those components. He pulls in traditions, mystical traditions um, from like yoga, um, chakra points, mantras, Buddhism, Taoism, um, and a bunch of mystical traditions that actually existed in humanity's history or exist now. And he uses those as a, a, a foundation, an explanation for why the main character could still learn magic, even if he doesn't get like AI assistance help. It's really cool. Believe me, when you read it, you'll like it. Um, but it, that also extends to the other parts of like everything in the story. So I, I really did like those points of it. Um, the main character is also very intelligent in what he does because he doesn't have the same assistance that everybody else does um, in getting like abilities and skills um, or even like not feeling as much pain as they do. He, he has to do things intelligently um, and he is faced against some really bad odds. Like the clan, um, so the the Eastman clan is a big power and they don't want to lose. They don't want to be proven false. They don't want to be proven. Um, they don't want to have uh, their reputation taken down by, by losing this bet with the guy. So they do everything they can to stop him. And so the main character has to be smart and he has to work within the mechanics of the world to succeed. And it's, it's a very good story. Um, there are a few things that aren't perfect though. And again, that's all that really is. They're not, they just like draw, drew me back a little bit for my enjoyment level, just stopping it for me in like that eight out of 10. Um, and they're not like really complaints as much as they're like, Oh, this probably could have been edited down a little bit. Um, some of the things just that I actually enjoyed just went on a little bit too long in the novel. Um, there are very realistic political conversations in this story, um, about essentially free economic models versus like, um, socialist and, um, communist rhetoric between those two concepts. Um, I won't, I won't spoil what it is, but, they go on several times, especially in the beginning of the story. And for me, and from sometimes other people, um, that probably goes on a little bit too long. Like I love discussions and I love bringing up interesting ideas and, and interesting discussions. That's really cool. I, I like that about the story. It's just that it mm, probably did it a little too much. And that, that's just a personal opinion. Um, additionally, the magical training section of the story is a full 10% of the novel. Um, and like I said, that I, I like that scene. I really did. Um, but it's like 50 pages worth of information about like magical yoga poses. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, that's probably a little bit too much detail. Like I, th- th- that's something that the author does really well. Like he adds a lot of detail, historical, cultural. Um, but that little section there, I'm like, I don't need 50 pages of magical yoga poses. So I, I kind of got it the first couple sentences. Um, and he doesn't just like do just magical yoga poses. Again, he goes into other things like Buddhism, Taoism, chakra points, mantras, and all that good stuff. Um, but it probably just went on a little bit too long. So there you go. Um, additionally, like this last point is, is just probably the thing that tipped it back from the eight a lot is the fact that there isn't as much progress in the main quest in the story as I thought there would be. Um, without spoiling details, essentially, um, part of the bet is that the main character has to prove that he's as good as somebody who from who, who had gotten the same advantages. Um, but he's also hampered in a lot of ways, um, including not having luck. 
Um, and that, that plays in a big part of the story in that he, things are just harder for him because he doesn't get AI assistance anymore because that's a, apparently a reflection of having zero luck. Um, but he, and but his, his quest to get out of that beginner system is also made super difficult. Like, this is slightly spoiler. Most people have to do like two or three things to get out of, out of, that, out of that, that, that area. He has to do five. Um, and they're really hard five things to do. Uh, it seems almost impossible, but he, he knocks out one of them fairly quickly in the story, like the first, um, I'd say 30, 40% or th- probably 30% of the novel. Um, and so I assume, I guess, this is my expectation, I guess, that he would, in the other 70%, probably knock out at least one more, but he doesn't. And so that just that expectation of more progress in that storyline and it not being fulfilled just dropped it down a little bit for me. I guess it's not, it's not necessarily bad. It's just that that was my experience reading the story. Um, but like I said, the author does a lot of really good stuff in the novel. It's a really good read that pits the little guy against like a powerful enemy that's willing to cheat to stop him from proving its point. There are great sci-fi elements in the novel as well in the real world storyline at least. And that was a nice break from just straight fantasy. Um, like I said, that's a really good story. I'm not saying it's not. It's really, really good. I really do enjoy it. Um, it's just shy of being like that eight, unfortunately. Um, so it gets a score of seven out of 10 for me. So there you go. Um, and again, go also go check out that author interview. It was nice talking to somebody who who came from a different background than me. Uh, the author, um, Aaron J, comes from like a, uh, a, a writing um, background of like, being in the movies and writing scripts and doing television and movie development uh, kind of things. Um, so it was really interesting to see that perspective. So go check out that interview. It was highly entertaining as well. Uh, but that's it. Everybody, show's done. Um, we finished. Finito. Uh, get, the, get the picture away. There you go. There's the picture gone. Um, remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. And if you want to support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, um, you can always find out all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com forward slash support. But a really big way is just to go to our Facebook page for the Lit RPG podcast and follow us. You get all the nice reviews we give, notifications for whenever um, you know we have a new podcast for you. It'll be sent to you or you'll be notified at least that it's available, um, including like some fun stuff. So there you go. Um, thank you very much for hanging out with me today. Um, it, I know a long episode just because we have a lot of reviews. Uh, this one went over like a little bit over an hour. So thanks for sticking it out and enjoying everything. And again, until we can hang out again, folks, remember to go read some Litter BG. Goodbye, everybody.